Um, and are we rolling? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, you might know me as Cat Food, but I've got like a, I've got a different hacker name when it comes to changing the world. I'm some guy on Bridge, and there's a story behind that that, that we'll get to a little bit later because the whole Occupy thing has awesome nicknames. They're much better than hacker culture that way. Um, this talk is going to be on refactoring the revolution. We're looking at the Occupy Wall Street phenomenon as though a really big agile project, which it really is. Um, is this a 50-minute session or a full hour? Have until 5 o'clock. Okay, if somebody back there could like start waving their arms when it's like 10 minutes left or so. so no, okay, thanks. And then we've got the post-session session in what room? It's upstairs, right? Upstairs. You'll find us upstairs. So, um, so um, this, this talk is titled Refactor the Revolution or I Got Your Burn-Up Chart Right Here, Pal. Um, now, Nauticon, in the, in the promotional materials, Nauticon says that the conference is about hacking life. And I think that's awesome, but I think you guys are setting your sights too low. I think hacking life is for chumps. I think the, the more interesting thing to hack is the world. Hack society. Change the way the system works. Or if you're really radical, change the system and replace it with something completely different. Um, and that's what this is about. Now, a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, I, I, was, I was like this like total hardcore activist punk in high school. I know I don't look like it. But um, yeah, yeah, but um, in 1983, 1982 actually, I took over the high school newspaper. And we were, we were badass. We had, um, there, was a, there was a competing a competing newspaper, an underground newspaper by this guy named Damien. It was called The Rag, and it was like handwritten. It was like reproduced off-site. And this, and this fellow Damien was a friend of mine. You know, we were like, we were like competing in the journalism business, except I had, le I had legitimacy and he had street cred. And um, he got busted by the school administration for handing out unauthorized journalistic materials at the high school. And... Um, and there was, there was actually, there were lawyers involved. It was kind of exciting. And what really, really pissed off the school administration was when the legit high school paper ran an editorial that I wrote completely supporting the underground paper. It was hilarious. Um, and that was kind of one of my first experiences of, you know, you got authority, you got legitimacy, and then you got, then you got sometimes authority people kind of have their head up their ass. So that's kind of, you know, that's, that's where I come. So, so we were supporting the Occupy newspaper back in the day. Um, we also had a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Free, you know, we had free speech uh, editorials and news articles. I got, um, I got something run by the ACLU. It was really, really awesome. And, and you know, things change. You grow up, you know, you go to college, you get a job, you have kids, you do things, and you're going, oh, you know, I can't really do the exact same thing that I did in high school because I got like a different set of responsibilities. Um, and so, this is how it changes, and this is how you apply the things that you learn in your workplace to changing the world. But what's here today is I'm hoping that when we're done with this, in about 50 minutes or so, that you've learned a little bit about what this whole Occupy Wall Street movement is about, and also a little bit about agile software development, because I realized that when I did the free view the other night, there wasn't 100% connecting with where I was going with that. So we're going to go over a few of the basics of that. And the things they have in common. Because the Occupy movement, the whole Arab Spring movement, all that stuff is really about three things. It's about caring for people over process. And it's about being real about how people actually live their lives and how people actually do their work. And finally, just, apply, and finally, just about how the whole underlying concept of the Agile Manifesto totally applies when you're not developing software, but you're developing social systems. Are you with me so far? Is there anything else you really wanted to hear about this? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to that. Um, so in general, agile software development. Uh, several years ago, a bunch of the top development gurus got together, had a, had a bunch of ideas in common that were considered pretty weird off the wall and radical at the time and have become somewhat mainstream since then. They called it the Agile Manifesto. Um, I think I have it up on another tab here. No, I do not. Okay. 
Um, and they just came up with a list of, list of principles where they said simply that when it comes to getting your software project done, you're all wondering why I say project, right? I really, really want to be Canadian. Yeah, that's because I'm pro, yeah. <laughs> no, Chris. Uh, yes, I desperately want to be Canadian, Occupy Toronto. Anyway, um, and that they came together with a, a shared vision of how software development could be done a lot better when you work with the grain of how people naturally live and work rather than imposing a system on them that is not how people really work. And some of those things involve prioritizing getting stuff done over having a certain tool or a certain tactic. Because isn't it more important that you make, actually make progress on what you're supposed to be doing, progress, on what you're supposed to be doing rather than using a certain tool set. Um, responding to change is prioritized over following a plan. So rather than, rather than in agile development, rather than saying, oh, a year and a half from now, you are going to be working on that task, which is really dumb when you think about it, because what business doesn't radically change plans within a year and a half? So you design your project in such a way that you can respond to change. You don't plan too far ahead, and you certainly don't plan past your event horizon. Uh, and you're constantly monitoring actions and activities and results. So. Uh, in a lot of shops, you have two-week iterations or perhaps even one-week iterations. So you're working Monday through Thursday, perhaps, and on Friday morning, you've got special time on Friday morning to go over what happened in that week, and you adjust the following week's schedule to match. Again, you keep reality checking what goes on instead of saying, oh, in theory, we should be at this point. Theory sucks. Knowing where you actually are is so much better. Again, stuff applies very much to, uh, to all kinds of activism. So anyway. I graduated from high school. I, they actually let me graduate. It was kind of awesome. And you know, I went to college and took you know took five years to graduate. Kind of then you know, kind of they got, got married, had kids. I, I have four kids, uh, and and your priorities shift a little bit. You know, when you when when your your big issue was the Vietnam War or or Cold War or or environmentalism or or or, and you go, oh yeah, I've got my world got a little bit smaller. And I paid attention. I personally paid attention to more things that were local happenings. Uh, in the late 80s, there was a lot of really interesting things going on in Cleveland with regard to development, uh, the way the city was allocating, uh, allocating money, the way tax policy was going. It was just headache-inducing, but it was very close to home. And I learned a lot about how to actually uh, make a statement and how to actually educate people on what's jacked up and how it can be done differently. Um, it didn't have much effect because you know Cleveland's still a pit, but but I did learn a ton from it. So so this 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 went on, and now now my kid now my kids are older, and and that changes again. And so um, and so we're looking at today's situation, where what's happening? There's there's a number a small number of people, not even the one percent, but really the point oh oh you know epsilon percent that have really trashed the economy in this, you know, by driving banks into the ground, by driving mortgages into the ground, by breaking everybody's home prices, by conducting illegal foreclosures, that sort of thing. And that really sucks. A lot of these people have gotten bonuses. There are actually more people responsible for the economic crash who are working in high positions in the White House than are actually under indictment. That really sucks. Uh, education, not being funded. Unemployment, still not really being addressed. That sucks too. Uh, fracking. If you're local here or from Pennsylvania, you heard a little bit about fracking, and everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, what is this? Wait, what we have going on now? Seriously, today? Give me a minute of polemic here. That we've got a way of extracting fossil fuels that involves drilling a hole in the ground, shooting it full of chemicals, causing toxic earthquakes, and then sucking it all out to get the gas. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. That sucks. And um, we find that conventional approaches to solving these social problems don't work. You know, oh, right, your congressman. Okay, whose congressman is not on the take? I live like two blocks out of Dennis Kucinich's district, so I can't raise my hand either. Uh, yeah, that Congress has really been bought. Um, I think in some ways the presidency has been bought. At some level, you have to go around the media. You have to go around official channels because they're always marginalizing the good ideas. Now, how many of you work in some kind of technical development shop, hardware, software, 
uh, scientific, you know, basically software hacking. Not so many, or you just you're just bored to tears already, and you're not going to raise your hand. Okay, or software development, anything like that? Yeah. And does it ever happen that the good ideas get marginalized? <laughs> Why? Why does that happen? I'm sorry. It wasn't their idea. Why else? Difficult to implement. Why else? Ah, very good. Nobody's paying enough attention. Yes. That's not how we do things here. Nepotism. Yeah, see, yeah, see, I did not plant this guy, but that was very good. Um, any, any other reasons why the good ideas get marginalized? Yo, Chris. Nice. Supporting in existing infrastructure, maintaining status quo, all of these, all these inertia things, right? Things that need to change don't change. And some of the, some of the answers you gave are kind of closely related to what's going on in political systems where there's a natural inertia to changing things because people get used to their systems. You know, there's bureaucracy, there's, there's status quo. But there's also people who are really invested in keeping the status quo. That's not just the cost of change. It's that, wait, I'm on top. I'm making a lot of money in the system. I'm getting what I want in the system. And I've got a lot of control over the system. So I'm going to keep the system the way it is. And so we as people who have some influence over our own society have to go, OK, going through the ordinary approach of electing better people in Congress, which we thought we did a few years ago, and that didn't work out so well, um, changing the system through voting, I endorse, but it obviously hasn't gone very far in actually fixing things like the banking crisis, hasn't, hasn't done anything for the environment, hasn't really, hasn't really improved the big picture in, in, much of a, in, a, in a really big way. And this thing's going to come back in a moment. So it made me think completely of how software development used to be done all the time. You remember the waterfall development model, right? You start with requirements, and the requirements influence the design, right? Design influences development coding, and then you do quality assurance. And then it goes downhill. And it's called a waterfall system because, you know, if you see a waterfall, things go down and down and down. You know what? I just realized. Have you ever seen a waterfall that has that many steps to it? Oh, but anyway, okay, but anyway, that's what it's called. It's called waterfall development. And the thing that has always struck me as really wrong with waterfall software development is this link right here. Development and quality assurance. And if you've done software development, you know how this, in a big outfit, you know how this goes. You're writing some code, and it goes to QA, and it comes back from QA, and they say, oh, there's a defect here, there's a defect there. And what? 50% of the time, it's something you screwed up, right? Other 50% of the time, what is it? That wasn't the feature we needed. It was poorly designed. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't what we asked for. And so you find yourself, this is actually not a correct, this is not how it really works. Because your quality assurance feeds back to development, but it really should be feeding back off into requirements and design. And that's how the Agile Manifesto guys, they, they realized this was happening. And the Agile Manifesto guys realized that this is not a correct model of how actual people really screw up. But management people got it in their head that the place where you fix the screw-ups is after the developers have touched it. There's not QA after the requirements, because who does requirements? Them. It's not done after design and architecture, because that's done by the people who are kind of at a slot above you as a developer, right? So infallible, infallible, and then the fuck-ups, right? And so there's really a large element of classism to waterfall software development. That's going on my resume. Right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. The, myth the Mythical Man Month, which is a great book. Have you read that one? It's really awesome. Get it out of the library or something. It's cheap. It's free. Um, but yes, what happens is that the people who are actually doing the, the monkey work are the ones whose quality is being measured. The people, the 1%, aren't being measured because their work, by definition, is perfect. And agile processes go, you know what? That's not really, that's not really how real things work. How things work is that you, you keep doing incremental development, 
and you get your requirements a little bit of a time, a little bit at a time as the as the project as the project see slip um, as the project moves along, and that way nobody's infallible. Nobody is making a big declaration from on top of doing a big big design up front, big design top down. You do design a little bit at a time, and it's very collaborative. So anyway, that's you know this is me working away. I'm plugging away in software development for you know like 15 years before this thing comes along, and I've you know I've kind of developed to a point where I see what's wrong with how most software gets done, but I hadn't really caught on to the Agile thing. And then, then I read a little bit about the Agile Manifesto and I just went, oh, yeah, that's it, that's right. That's what's wrong, is the whole idea of forcing people to take on a task off, of, you know, off the task queue, their, their assigned tasks, that may or may not be the thing that they're ready to do at that time, may not be the thing they have the skills for, but it's the next thing on the list and they get, and they get it shoved to them and it may not be the place where they can be the most effective. Uh, whereas in a lot of Agile um, practices, such as Kanban, you go and pick the task you do next because you know what you're capable of doing in the next 24 hours. You know what you're capable of doing in the next work week. And that, and that empowers the individual developer to drive a little bit more of their own course and to collaborate as peers with the people they're working with rather than being told every day what to do. It's not only more humane, it's also smarter because people tend to get stuff done when, you know, when they know where they're going. Uh, the Agile principle is called honor people over processes. That you, know, you, may have, you may have had a very structured process, but what's more important is the people that you have in front of you, and it's a small, usually a small team, usually no more than seven or so. And then, and then I'm looking, uh, then I'm, around last September, this thing erupts on Wall Street, and the first thing, the first thing I'm noticing, actually there's a lot of things I'm noticing, but one of the first things I'm noticing is that these kids, these grandmothers, these college students and steel workers out in Zuccotti Park, they're self-organizing like crazy. It's funny because you get the, you know, you get the, you know, you tune in Fox News and, you know, Everybody's being dictated to by George Soros. No, 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 that's, that's crazy. I've never actually gotten a check from George Soros that cleared. It's just not true. And, and it's, it's highly self-organized. And um, all decisions on Occupy Wall Street, all major decisions, are made by a consensus process. Does anybody here know what consensus? Where the heck is Angela? Yeah, OK, t can you describe consensus in a nutshell? Ah. Yeah, you you've got um and and actually uh we got some tech help here that it's really cool if you use a microphone. I didn't know that. Actually what we could do would be really fun as we could go people's mic on this. No. <laughs> Have you, seen, have you seen that? It's a really fun device. It's a, it's a distraction, but it's a fun device. Um, in Zuccotti Park in particular, there was an ordinance against amplification. You could have the biggest meeting you want, but you can't amplify sound. And what the group realized very quickly was that no matter how loud the person who was speaking was speaking, they just couldn't be heard in a, when there's 1,500 people all gathered. So what they, what they did was the, somebody would say a sentence and the first bunch of rows who could hear that person clearly would just repeat it very loudly. And then the next bunch of rows would repeat that very loudly. And the next rows would repeat it very loudly. It was a really cool innovation for a few reasons. One is it looks totally badass, am I right? It looks very underground, very rebellious. Fuck the man, we don't need amplification. We got the power of the people. But it also, it also feeds into consensus in a weird way because part of developing consensus in your software development team or in your revolution is actually listening to what everybody else has to say. So if I go to a meeting at Occupy Wall Street or Occupy Cleveland and I've got a plan for how we're gonna do the next rebellious action and I've got it all thought out in my head and I know exactly what I wanna do and I make that a proposal, um, that's, that's the wrong 
that's the wrong attitude because that's not including everybody in making the best decision possible. Um, were you, was any, uh, how many of you were at Angela Harms' session yesterday on collaboration? Okay, yeah, big overlap here. Because one, one key feature of collaboration, as Angela described it, was not that you hang out and pick out the best individual solution. That's good, I mean, picking out the best individual solution is good, but what's better is making a better solution out of what everybody has to contribute. So somebody comes with an idea, and more and more ideas feed into that idea. And so that's how the consensus model should work ideally, that if I'm coming to a meeting, I've got a proposal, I don't have it necessarily fully formed, but I'm listening to everybody else. And if you're using the people's mic, it's even more awesome because if, if I'm talking about my proposal and somebody comes and has an idea about it, there's why they're opposed to it or they've got a way to improve the proposal, I literally have to listen to them because I'm repeating every word they say. I can't avoid listening to them. It's kind of awesome that way. Um, it also, the other thing that it does that I think is very important is it makes it very easy to be heard if you don't personally have a loud voice. And movements have trouble with inclusion. And if you've got an unusual accent, if you're a physically small person who may not have a really big voice, if you're just naturally shy, or you tend to, you tend to uh, um, have gaps in your speaking, anything like that makes it hard for everybody to hear you, that's equalized by the people's mic. It's kind of awesome. So anyway, that's the people's mic. Um, so, so this is one of the, so consensus is this, this process by which everybody, everybody's input goes into the final decision and nobody gets rolled. So if I am, if I've come where I've got a severe moral problem with this plan, whatever it is, I might be voting no on it, or I might be disputing it, I may be indicating I've got a negative, yeah, yes, and, and Amy, Amy's not quite disagreeing with me back there. <laughs> that the common set of hand signals, one that, one that is used in Cleveland anyway, is, okay, I agree with what's being said, this is a good proposal, I'm supporting this. Um, I'm not sure about supporting this, but I'm not, but I'm not gonna tell people, yes, thank you, Julia. <laughs> I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna block it, I'm gonna stand aside. I think, you know, I actually don't really like this, but for the good of the group, I think this is good, en this is good enough to, to not block. Uh, this is something I actually oppose. I'm actually opposing this. And then this one, which you hardly ever see is, oh my God, this is so jacked up, I'm out of here. It's, it's, for, it's for when, you know, yeah, the, and Adrian's got the middle finger. Yeah, see, you understand. And this is like you're saying, it's a continuous feedback. You can actually do that when somebody's talking. It's not normal, but you could do that when somebody's talking, like, dude, no, you're way off. Or you see people doing things like this. Yeah, you rock, this is what you're saying. This is, and Julia's telling me to shut up and move it along. <laughs> this is like, okay, we get your point, move it along. We've got, yeah, rock on, you're right. Um, and, then, and then of course, the one that we in Cleveland desperately needed after some really, really poorly proceeding GAs, General Assembly sessions, when the men were pretty much swinging their dicks all the time is we developed this hand signal. We only needed to use it like twice before we got the point. It was absolutely fucking hilarious though. Yeah, and yeah, I think, Julie, was that your invention? No, yeah, but anyway. Uh, and so we use, the, we use that whole consensus, the, the concept of consensus, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Now, here's where Occupy Movement really diverges from software development, and we're just kind of figuring this out now seriously, is if you're in a software development shop, you're pretty much on the same track as to what needs to get done. You've been assigned a project. You've got to get this thing built, and it's got to fulfill the business requirements. And it's got to be done by a certain time, right? right? And generally, everybody gets that, and it's named. Problem when you have this big open air movement that represents supposedly 99% of people Guess what? You got a lot of different agendas. And so when you're planning specifically, when you're planning an action, action, you know, shorthand for doing a march, doing a sit-in, doing a blockade, you know, whatever kind of, you know, covering the Brooklyn Bridge, whatever you're going to do, sometimes it's valid to do something like that just as a way of building the group's skills and getting good at putting on other actions. Very important. 
Um, sometimes the case of when Occupy Cleveland has done some really intense actions in support of people who've been busted in foreclosures, it's to encourage the victims. You may not actually change anything, but you're showing people that somebody cares, but that's a different, that's a different goal. Um, sometimes you want to get out and show people why you were right and everybody else is wrong, and so you're out to gain public support. That's a different agenda. Sometimes, admittedly, people just want attention. Not always good. Or sometimes you want to motivate a specific action. Sometimes you just like, you know, you just like stirring up a little bit of chaos. And these are not all good, and they're not all compatible. So when you're in a consensus-based system, what happens? It's really hard to get everybody together on the same thing. And after one really, really dreadfully long General Assembly session in November, October, November, I went to a fellow named Ben, who is an experienced community organizer. This guy had like, you know, he like thrown himself in front of the fracking trucks. I mean, this guy was hardcore, okay? And he was like our resident, he was like our resident um, consensus expert. And I said, how come this is so crazy here out in Public Square in Cleveland, but it works so well in these other things you've been involved in? He says, it's really simple. That when I'm out on the barricades with the anti-fracking people, it's two dozen people that I came through many struggles with before, and I already know these people, and we are absolutely solid on what the mission is. And if we're absolutely solid on what the mission is, you're not having these underlying philosophical disputes about whether you want to be blocking this fracking event anyway. You're all, you're all together on it, and so you can have a consensus discussion without being led astray by, but wait, we should be voting for Ron Paul. No, you're on one thing. And yes, I mean, we've had that happen. Um, so that is where the whole consensus thing breaks down, and I gotta tell you, that's something we struggle with. Because when you're trying to do a movement that's 99% of all people, and is trying to represent the interests of 99% of all people, yeah, guess what? 99% of people do not freaking agree on things. And so that makes it extremely difficult. So, so what happened is the, you know, this whole Arab Spring thing came around, which you know about, and then the Wall Street September, and this one weekend I'm sitting, sitting around at home with the least jaded person I know. Yes, if you were here last year, you know the least jaded person I know. And she's, she's an anarchist. And she's like bouncing up and down, it's kind of awesome. And she's like bouncing up and down and she's, go, and she's like looking at daily coasts and there's like pictures of, pictures of you know, this and the pepper spraying and the, and she's saying, huh? this is so awesome, she says, this is so awesome. The revolution is really happening, we have to go. And I'm like, well, you know, you might be an anarchist, but I have like a job and stuff. So yeah, you just, you know, you just go on to Wall Street. And, and then very soon thereafter, a few local people organized a Occupy Cleveland offshoot. And we said, oh, that's, that's our place, that's our place. And so you're, what, four weeks behind Wall Street? And beginning of October, yeah, and there's, there's the least jaded person I know, hi. And uh, there's a big march, there's a big rally, and there's a, there's a big gathering of the Free Stamp. Who's from Cleveland? Who knows the Free Stamp? Yeah, okay. Big gathering of the Free Stamp. It was awesome. Who was there? Yeah, okay, like three of us were there. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and it was a highly motivating experience. The RTA drivers were honking and thumbs up. They're a union. <laughs> Seriously, the cops are like, Okay, you want to like stay on the sidewalk and not walk on the street because we're going to regretfully have to write you up for that, but rock on because they're a union. And we had a very strong union issue on the ballot in November, so it was a big thing. And so there was a lot of energy. It was kind of, it was kind of exciting. Uh, it was also highly disorganized. But we ended up, um, <laughs> I told you I'd get to that. We ended up forming kind of a tent village on the sidewalk on Public Square. So I mean, it's still, it, well, there's still a tent there. We can go into that a little bit. But a lot of people who know me were saying, how did you get to be some guy in Bridge? And the thing is, Occupy's got way better nicknames than the hacker community does. Um, yeah, so there's, there's the one dude, the one really intense organizer dude who, I think that's pretty good. People lose track of last names, so there's just like a tall one and a short one, pretty much, you know. But, but the awesomest name was there was this one dude early on in the tent city days who was like what six one, clean shaven, steely blue eyes, in shape, great posture, spoke in almost complete sentences, 
And it came to my attention after a while that when everybody was talking about how we've been infiltrated, they were talking about him. And there was a special announcement at the General Assembly that night, you know, the big meeting of it. Um, hey, everybody. Um, this is John. He's not a cop. That was like a special announcement. <laughs> we have checked this guy out. He's not a cop. Actually, yeah. Um, so in that, in that environment, you know, you can't really go around being cat food. But my, my name, uh, kind of on the local political blog scene, I'd always been some guy in Mapledale because I lived in Mapledale Avenue. Then I got evicted. Well, not evicted, but encouraged to leave. And so I got a, you know, I got a new place on Bridge Avenue, Bridge Avenue in Ohio City. And so I became some guy in Bridge. And that never really caught on, but I'm sticking with it anyway. Um, but anyway, we do have the, do we, am I missing out on any of the really good nicknames? No, but not a cop John was the classic. Yeah, so, so this is how the tent city came out. Um, this is like on the west side of Public Square, and this is happening, that date is misleading, that's when he downloaded it or something. This is actually happening in uh, uh, early, middle of October. And uh, unbelievably, we had permits. No, no, we didn't have permits for that. And uh, it was kind of tolerated because, I don't know, we weren't making any trouble. And, and it evolved into a really interesting semi-self-sustaining community. Um, we needed funding. I mean, people had to bring money and food. But there were people who lived here on the west side of Public Square really continuously. And there was a long period of time where I'd just get up in the morning and go to work from here. And a lot of people did that. And people brought their own tents. There was one night where, was that, a, was that the storm? Where some of the tents had, yeah, I think, there was a, I think there was a storm. And police officers came by. And at first, people were a little bit apprehensive until we realized that they were bringing new tents. Some cops had gone home and brought on their, picked up their own camping gear and donated it. So at the same time in New York, where people were getting maced and pepper sprayed and, and arrested for like nothing, um, in Cleveland, we were like getting free tents with the cops. And of course, you had to have the one person saying, they're bugged. <laughs> and at the end, we'll get into who the enemy really is, OK? Because that just, that just feeds into it. Um, so that's, you know, so I'm talking a little bit about where agile principles don't apply. Are we getting that so far? Here, yes? Here's where they do kind of apply. Um, one of the major agile principles is responding to change rather than following a plan, like I said earlier. And when you've got so much stuff going on at once, it's really hard to plan more than about three weeks ahead because something will come up. And what happened, um, in, you know, over late in the fall was somebody in the foreclosure working group got a phone call from a friend of a friend of a friend of this woman named Beth who lived in West 94th near uh, Lorraine Avenue. And her story was, oh, you know, the big bad banks are getting her and she got kicked out of her house illegally and blah, 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 blah. And we were like, should have a total protest of that, which sounded really awesome. And so I got together with the least jaded person I know and we went down and visited Beth and she was still living in this place because she hadn't been quite evicted yet. And we're like all ready you know, to go blockade the sheriff and all that kind of neat stuff. And we just spent an hour just talking about what the situation was. And you know, sometimes it turns out that the situation isn't exactly what you think. And you have these big plans and you better make an adjustment. We kind of found that actually she'd been foreclosed on a long time ago. And so like you really can't protest foreclosure that happened five months ago. And she'd actually like been technically, yeah, it was two years. It was two years way, you know, way beyond. I said, well, yeah, okay, probably, probably reversing that foreclosure isn't really going to happen, right? Because, you know, so she already didn't own the place, but, you know, she was a tenant there. And what we found was that her major issue, and she's got two small children, you know, so, you know, being on the street would be really bad, that she had a new place to go to. She even had a new place to go to. And she could even afford the new place. It just wasn't ready yet. It would take another month to have the new place ready. So... Okay, we had a big plan of something really heavy. And it turns out that what really needed to happen was, wow, if somebody could have like three or four more weeks to move, that would totally work. 
And so there were phone calls to city council and there was phone calls to newspapers and press releases and we were talking to the property management company that was fixing a kicker out in the, in the sheriff's department, blah, blah, blah. And basically what it came to was, if you're the property management company and it's your job to maintain this house in the name of the bank and you've got to move, a, you've got to move an evicted tenant out and there are like 30 plus tents in the yard with hippies in them, all weekend, you know what, you can wait a month, right? And so that's what happened. This, uh, actually Julie, what, 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 was, it, was it a weekend? I think it was a, yeah, that's right, so, so you know, on the weekend, you know, if you're the county sheriff and you're prepared to do this eviction, you come around and the yard is full of hippies. Not hippies, but they're, yeah, there's some hippies. And, <laughs> and they just, Yes, yes, that's true. There are tents, but there are no showers. <clears throat> Just saying. And, um, and so rather than going through the original plan of fighting the foreclosure, we said, you know what? If we can buy Beth a few weeks, that's freaking awesome. And that's what we did. Um, there, there's also an agile principle of doing the simplest thing that could possibly work, often abbreviated to DTTSD to CPW, whatever, CPW. And I keep finding myself mentioning that around, around Public Square. My favorite example of this was this one time we're having a very long conversation about this particular issue, which was that there are a lot of people that were maintaining the big service tents, you know, the storage tent, the food tent, the, you know, and these big 20 foot long canopies that, that we had propped up on Public Square. And somebody had a very valid point that if you're doing the grunt work of building this tent, keeping things up, and, it's a, and there's a meal being served, you're gonna miss out on the food, right? And so there was a proposal at the general, hand signal for, there was a proposal at the General Assembly that we do the following, that when there's a meal coming around, we put the food working group in charge of coming and finding everybody who's doing physical labor and tracking them down and letting them know that there's food and perhaps bringing them food. And this thing had a really long discussion because we do it all by consensus. And it, it was worked out. And meanwhile, by the way, the food People were actually, in fact, making dinner at the time, so they were not in this conversation. And at the time, the food working group was largely an offshoot of this group called Food Not Bombs. Heard of Food Not Bombs? Okay, yeah, yeah. Are they totally badass? They're totally badass. So, so this long discussion goes on, and we finally reach a consensus on, hey, somebody's gonna go and get the food people and like be in touch with them. And then the food working group people would come around and let everybody know that that dinner's ready. So dinner comes around, and we go to the food tent, and I'm talking to Gus. Gus is this one guy with Food Not Bombed. He's kind of cool. And I said, hey, you know what? We just had this discussion about something, and I recapped the thing for him, and he just looked at me, doing the simplest thing that could possibly work. And he looked at me, and he said, dude, we're anarchists. They could have just asked. <laughs> And I'm like, yes, you're totally right. We did not do the simplest thing that could possibly work. We had legislation, <laughs> legislation trying to make something happen when you could have just asked. How many times have you had that happen at work? Yeah, we have a, <laughs> you have a policy, you have a committee meeting, you have a, you have a design document that it, it attempts to dictate something that everybody could just self-organize on. So that's, you know, this is another core, you know, another correlation. Um, So we're at a pretty good point for questions. Does anybody have any questions on this so far? What are your questions? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, how did I go to work? Um, I live pretty close. Oh, occupy the microphone. Okay, the question is, how did I get to work? Yeah, and I had this, I, I had this like total, I had this total awesome corporate gig in the suburbs, so it was really fun, like, you know, waking up in the hippie tent and, um, and it was pretty convenient for me because I actually lived just west of downtown. So I could just pretty much like go home, get breakfast, have a shower, put on my own coffee that, you know, and you know, vary 1%. And uh, just drive it. It actually worked out fine. You get up early enough, it's fine. And actually, uh, around Public Square, parking is free until about uh, 6.30 a.m. So if you get up early enough, you don't have to pay for parking either. Yay! Um, so yeah, that kind of worked out. Yeah. Okay. Chris, what you got? Uh, my question is, what is going on with the movement? 
That's a fabulous question, and I wish I could answer that. Actually, the, um, and we're talking about the Cleveland movement, correct? Worldwide. Worldwide, okay. Worldwide, wow. Yes. Yes, I, I really like that question. I hate that question, and I love it. <laughs> that a lot of what's going on is, especially the outdoor presence, it really sucks in the winter. And so a lot of the, the physical occupation has been very slight. Um, even Zuccotti Park has pretty much moved indoors. Um, and what, what has been going on nationally and somewhat locally is a lot of training. You know, it's spring, it's spring training. There's a lot of people who've been involved who have never done any kind of social change movement before. They weren't around. Yeah. <laughs> Julia, said, Julia said last summer something like, you know, we were talking politics and, and, you know, we agreed on a lot of things and she said, you know what, I'm so not motivated to actually do anything about these ideals that I have because I just don't care enough. I got my own life. October, she's out in the tents with everybody else because it is, it is a motivating thing. It's kind of exciting. But there's so many people who hadn't done this kind of stuff before. They bar you know, had barely called a member of Congress if they'd even done that, not really super involved. And so a lot of us don't know how to do things. You don't know, you know, don't know, don't know how to properly get arrested. Okay, very, it's very important to know how to get arrested properly. Um, don't know how to do a press release when you're doing a big action. Uh, so sometimes our media work isn't so good and things don't get printed. Um, don't know when to confront and when not to confront because sometimes you know sometimes you do not need to push a particular piece of land or not uh, don't need to push a particular issue with with city hall uh, oh all kinds of things how to um, how to do canvassing to talk to people in the community about the issues that you care about a lot of stuff our people locally really don't know very much about it and there's a few people who are really experienced organizers who spent a lot of time with the stuff, who are experts at it, who are sharing that information. And doing it in the winter is an awesome time because you're not doing anything else. Um, and one thing that's happened locally in Cleveland that I think has worked out with complex results is simply getting a place that's away from the public square site so the people who are really full-time in the movement have a place to sleep. Because one of the terms of having that big tent out in public square is that you can't actually have bedding or you can't be sleeping there. So simply having a different location went a long way. It's been difficult and complicated, but that's, you know, that's what's happening. Um, and what else, what, else, what other major thing I'm not thinking of here, Julia? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The next big thing is that there's a big May Day general strike action that's happening, that's centered in Chicago in the US, and a lot, thank you, and a lot of people come from the East Coast for that, and so, one of our people said, hey, you know what? Cleveland would be an awesome stop on the way. So um, we're putting on a thing called Occupy the Heart Festival. The Occupy the Heart Festival. It's kind of awesome. It's basically going to be a really big street party in Public Square. And uh, we're still working on a ton of the details, even though it's two weeks from now. But there will be, uh, you know, basically it'll be an awesome party. And perhaps there will be some, uh, some protest actions that people want to know about. And that's coming up in a couple weeks. That is a heck of a lot of organizing and, uh, and a little bit of fundraising, just saying. Um, so that, that's, that's cooking too, so you'll see a lot more about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's, is that a good answer, Chris? Yeah, when, when, is, when is your G8? That's in the middle of, yeah, go ahead. Yes. The protests were going to be so bad. Yes. Um, so that's going to be the next really public thing. There'll be a lot of arrests. Yeah, they've actually changed the laws to make it harder to do protesting, which is interesting. Yeah, and by the way, Julie, you know, I was trying to get Julie to co-present this, and I'm glad she is. <laughs> No. no. Oh, and the question is, do we have a sense of velocity in the Agile sense? No, because we don't have story points. Do you know? You know? What do I mean when I say story? And there's a question back there that I don't want to neglect. Okay, so you're on stack. 
Did I do good there? Okay. Um, what are story points? In several agile practices, such as Kanban, you when you put a story up on the board, when, wow, a lot of background on that, but the smallest unit of work that you can account for is called a story. And you probably write it in an index card. And you say, because, I, you know, because I'm the customer, or as the customer, I want this functionality so this thing can happen, is typically how a story is written. So I want, I want the create button to create a new record in the database and fill in these fields, would be a story. And as part of the planning process, you say, you assign points, story points to that. It's really fun how we totally shifted that. And you, you assign number of story points to that story. One meaning it's really, really simple and anybody in the team can knock it off in, in a short time. Generally powers of two. And you say, oh, this is an eight point story because it's really complicated and it's gonna take a lot of work. If it's more than about eight points, most, of it, most shops will say, then if it's more than eight points, it's probably not one story, it's probably multiple stories, you should break it up. And so that's the story point concept. And if you're doing particularly a Kanban system, which is where you've got progress of something going from inception to uh, requirements, to design, to coding, to QA, and so on and so on, everything in the board is a column, you, you have a concept of velocity which is how many story points move from left to right in a period of time. And you might find that, that in a given week, when everybody's at work and nobody's out sick and nobody's on vacation, that you might find that 40 points migrate across the board and get done. And that's your velocity. And so you say, oh, we can, we can do 40 points a week. And then you can use that as a rough guide to future planning. It's not always super precise. In an agile development, you don't go for precision, you go for progress. And, and that's one rough measure of the progress. Is that a good answer? Okay. Uh, you sit in the back. Oh. Right. Yeah. What What do you do? What do you do when it's agile? To, when What do you do when it's when you're trying to do something in an agile way, whether it's software development or anything else, and they're screwing with you? I mean, in a typical software development project, right? You're You're doing your work, and there's nobody actively making it harder. You hope there's no opponent. There's no enemy. I mean, there's competition, right? There's the other. You know, there's the other company that's doing a similar product or something. But you don't have somebody who's actually going to come and arrest you for doing, for doing the project that you had in mind, right? And they're not going to change the rules on you so much. So how do you, how do you deal with, in an agile way, the fact that, that some laws might be more enforced against you? It was really funny when we were hearing that if you step into the street, you're going to get a jaywalking ticket when you're having a march. I, that was kind of odd. It's a thing that, you know, jaywalking isn't enforced that much. Hmm. Or when they're enforcing laws that have been previously under-enforced, under or when they're changing laws to make things harder that you thought you'd be able to do, how do you adapt to that? I'm going to kind of unask that question. I'm going to kind of kind of throw that back because a lot personal observation. I'm finding that we we can tend to do a little bit of pinky in the brain planning, and. There, there is, there is one, there is one event where there was, there was anticipated a police action that would have affected, that would have affected the Occupy movement. And I'm on the, um, on the grapevine, hearing, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, and more and more complicated responses were developed. When in fact, and I can't really say that much, but more and more complicated responses were developed when a really simple one would have totally sufficed. And I, and I just called out and said, dude, you're doing pinky in the brain planning. You know pinky in the brain, right? You know, we got this long, complicated chain of cause and effect, but really we should do the simple thing. Um, and actually, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Right. See, so I, talked, I talked ahead of 
I talked ahead of myself, so I'm going to back up here. Who is the enemy really? You know, there's a popular perception. Oh, thank you. There's this popular perception, right, that, you know, it's hassle lines. It's protesters up against riot cops and, and batons and mace and arresting people on the bridge. And that happens. That happens. But my personal experience, usually when something goes wrong, when you're doing a social movement, political movement, an Occupy movement, is what's in your own head. When an action doesn't go well, or when organization goes badly, it's very often self-generated. It's ego, it's assumptions, it's sometimes a high conflict personality, it's refusing to plan, it, it's that sort of thing. And at least from my observation, very often the really bad cases of this could be, present, could be prevented by better application of that. So it's not so different. You know, the, disaster, the disasters you actually face are more often internal organization, overspecifying, and, and shooting yourself in the foot. Not so much that the man is out to get you. Although the man is sometimes out to get you. But I find, I find that the self-generated issues are bigger. Um, it, you look like you're trying to follow up. Uh, okay, dude way in the back. That's a really good point, and just because of the microphone issue, I'll just repeat that uh, basically what he, what he called me out on was rather than necessarily pointing and saying, oh, look, all the, all the bad bankers are, you know, are working for the government now, or not all of them, but you know, that there's, there's all this influence peddling in DC in the spirit of doing the simplest thing that could possibly work, why confront where all the power is in DC and in the lobbying system? Why not do things that are more that that construct local alternatives to banking and finance that, that ordinary people can control a little bit. Is that a good summary? Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't capture all of it, I know. And that's difficult. I think there's two answers to that. One is that's difficult to do, and it takes a lot of responsibility, and people have to maintain that. And so that looks, in some ways, like it's not the simplest thing that could possibly work. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing is, I think also, that while local self-reliance is a great thing, sometimes, sometimes the machine that you're up against is so big and so overwhelming and so everywhere that you, you can't always go around it, that you can't always neglect it because you know, if there's a war on, you can't neglect it. If there is a global housing crash or a national housing crash, you can't ignore that. Some of these things really are that big, and they really are bigger than you and me, and bigger than the local community. But it is a point, well, that's a very valid point, though. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. And is the next speaker here? Is there a next speaker? Yeah, OK. OK. Don't want to step on you, man. Uh, yes, sir. One more question, I guess.
Oh, you two guys argue that among uh, between yourselves, okay? Because you like just had completely opposite. <laughs> yes, also true that sometimes the things you do in the local community get superimposed and stepped on by a larger authority, right? Is that, am I understanding you? Yeah. Yes, it's very fluid, and you have to adapt. OK, I, one more really wicked short one. Um, I think you have, you have, yes, please, you. Actually, that has come up. And do I have this here? I think I have this here. Um, that's actually another Agile thing, and it's something that I did not realize until it was gone is that one of the things that works really, really well in agile software development is working together daily. One of the principles is business people and developers working together daily is highly effective. And one of the things that is very difficult right now is people like me who have jobs and families and stuff and like do other things and do not live in the movement 24 hours. Man, we're really separated from, from the kids at the tent all the time. And there's a lot of, there's group think here, there's group think there. Simply being together in the same place for a long period of time actually in retrospect, was incredibly useful simply for understanding each other and where we're going. It, it made a big difference, and, and we really miss it now. So besides the visibility, simply being in one place was actually incredibly useful. And that's about all, 457, yeah, that's about all we have time for. So thank you all. Come upstairs, we'll talk more, we can argue, we can, we can have a grand old time with it. And uh, the, ne the next speaker is who? Brian, Brian Holman, and you're speaking on? That's not revolutionary, man. <laughs> Actually, kind of is. <laughs> yeah, hey, quick, quick question. If you want to get like involved or help contribute, like, you guys got like a website or something? Yeah. Yeah, actually, she. Um, Architecture.com. Dot, dot com. It is dot com, believe it or not. Yeah. Okay. And actually, um, what would you say the best, what's the best meeting to come to, really? Because the website's like, eh, you know? The website definitely needs some work. Because General, General Assembly is not necessary. Yeah, although last night was kind of amazing. I would say, like, Yeah. Yeah. There's a contact us.